Hey, I'm David Liggett with Data Center Hawk. I'm here with Pete Jones, uh, Chief Development Officer with Yonder, and we're talking about the data center industry. Next. Hey, I'm David Liggett with Data Center Hawk. Focus on cloud location, data center industry trends, and dynamic market. Pete, thank you for joining us here in Dallas. Excited to have you uh, in the office, in Pleasure. our studio, you bet. Um, you know, one of the, so I always tell people, this is one of my favorite things I get to do is sit down with people that have been in the industry a long time, yeah. uh, that are helping shape the design trends and development trends in uh, different parts of the world and, um, and just hear about their backgrounds sure. and kind of what led them to this point. So you're obviously chief development officer with Yonder. Mm -hmm. Um, but talk about um, some of the different roles you've had that really prepared you to do what you're doing now. Yeah, well, I guess maybe so. So development, for, you know, as as I talk about, it, is kind of everything everything that's the, the, that's at the front end. So it's uh, site selection, mm -hmm. utilities, uh, certainly at the macro global level. Sure. Um, also dealing with customers, we actually don't have a sales department because we believe it's an expert to expert business, sure. particularly at the at the scale that we are um, operating at. Um, and then kind of marketing and, and customer success and that end of it. So that's what, what development means in, in, in my world. Um, so my I guess my my original job of how I got into the industry was as an electrical engineer, um, which is, you know, I'm still recovering from, but but <laughs> but getting there. But it's uh, you know I think the Socratic method and you know problem solving and so on is yeah. is is a really ing ing required ingredient um, you know to be successful in the sector. So you know I was lucky enough to be mentored in early years um, in London, a couple of really good uh, design and engineering practices okay. there. Um, then hit digital realty in about 2009, just when things were really ramping up yeah. in, in 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 Europe, um, and then. 2011, uh, headed to Google. Uh, at that time, they're just setting up the self-delivery function at the hyperscale level in, in, in Europe, so helped be part of that. And then um, took a little career break, went, went, took a sailboat to New Zealand. Interesting. Which was, t it beats working, I'll tell you that. <laughs> sure. Um, and interestingly, not to draw some cheesy parallel, but you know, yeah. Offshore sailing is actually more about project management and resilience I and bet. everything yeah. than, than it really is about sailing, because once you're that far offshore, there isn't a lot to crash into. Sure. So <laughs> that was the, you know, a, a great year off yeah. uh, and then headed back to Google um, and worked more heavily on site selection, renewables, um, strategy about how we get into cloud and that yeah. kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, and then in Q4 2018, I joined Yonder just as we okay. were as we were really starting to get going. So tell me about uh, the Yonder group, kind of the vision for the company and where you all are focused today. Yeah, so I guess we are, where Yonder came from was uh, one of our sibling companies um, is a general contracting company, ISG. Okay. Um, and ISG was, was taken private a few years ago um, off the London Stock Exchange by the Cathexis Group, which is our, 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 our parent. Okay. And at that time, ISG was doing a lot of uh, hyperscale general contracting work mm -hmm. um, around Europe. And um, the ask was actually from customers about saying, hey, you're helping us solve part of the problem, which yeah. is our self-delivery program, but that ain't cutting it. So, mm -hmm. you know, is there is there a different value prop that you could that you could help us with? Um, and that's where Yonder came from, which was really a straight up play in terms of leveraging the best of our of of our group strengths. So, the general contracting company Cathexis also is a lot of a lot of different holdings, but some in the energy sector as well. Uh, ready access to capital. So we said, well, let's bring hyperscale megawatts to market. Um, and on an owner operator basis, um, and try and make those the fastest, most agile megawatts that we can. Yeah. And so we were pleased in uh, in in Q4, you know, to move one of our first customers into what we believe to be some of the fastest hyperscale megawatts delivered in in Europe. Yeah, and you know, you bring up an interesting trend that just speed to market, and how important. Uh, delivery supply, you know, the data center operator supply chain is today. Um, you know, it's really been interesting to watch how that's impacted larger companies' approach to getting uh, their infrastructure online. It certainly, has changed. Well, I think the, you know, particularly, I think some of the some of the phenomena out there, certainly at a European level, is that um, because a lot of the a lot of the center of gravity for for uh, design construction mm -hmm. HQs for a lot of global yeah. data center companies is is the UK that 
profit has been a bit of a dirty word. Mm -hmm. There's been a bit of a ra race to the bottom in, in terms sure. of margin and this yep. sort of a thing, which is, I think, you know, pushed out schedule and 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 made it a more um, adversarial um, kind of a setup than it really needs mm -hmm. to be. Um, so part of our model, actually, about how we went to attack it was saying, well, let's just start from first principles. Profit is not a dirty word. Get it out on the table. Sure. We embrace what... Uh, a method we call YPD, which is Yonder Project Delivery, which is a, you know, close cousin of integrated project delivery that we, you know, you have a, a, a group of all the principal people yeah. involved steering the project together. So it's not one, you know, kind of uh, master um, servant kind mm -hmm. of uh, relationship. So that's that that's where we started um, to, to, to get megawatts to market mm -hmm. faster. Because I guess that's the thing is that if we take the 10 year retrospective view, um, the stakes had never been higher as far as um, uh, scale goes. Yeah. Um, the aspirations around schedule have never been more aggressive. <laughs> yeah. And the aspirations around pricing have never been more aggressive. Sure. Um, so, you know, you combine all those things together and you say, well, what's got to give? Well, you got to get it. You got to get more efficient. Yeah. You got to get quicker because the macroeconomics ain't going to change. Mm -hmm. So that's the angle that we've tried to kind of look yeah. at it from yeah. um, is solving for 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 the big picture problem yeah. on a sustainable at scale uh, basis. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when you think about Europe as a whole and the markets that, you know, traditionally see a lot of activity, um, you know, you and I both know those areas like London and Frankfurt and Paris and Amsterdam and Dublin uh, and some others. But what are you seeing as far as trends impacting those markets today? Uh, you know, we certainly at times in every, I would say, like global regions see, you know, uh, supply go up, demand yeah. go up in certain areas just based off of, um, you know, overall user trends and maybe different area trends. But what are some of the things, trends that you would say are impacting European markets today or will impact those markets in the future that people should be aware of? Yeah, I mean, I suppose the, probably if I was to choose one kind of word to characterize the last couple of years has probably been supply demand volatility. Mm. Um, and, you know, not to teach anyone how to suck eggs, but, you know, talking about the the very elastic nature of public uh, public cloud demand sure. um, and the very inelastic nature or the, the ability <laughs> to respond to these yeah. demand signals on the supply side, yeah. you know, couldn't be further apart. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I think the certainly what we've seen in, I guess you would say, you know, what, what, what are the largest public cloud markets, you know, outside the US, you in, in European terms, probably, you know, the UK and Germany. So mm -hmm. if you think about the, the volatility that London and Frankfurt have experienced, um, the pace at which um, competing public cloud providers are, are trying to take down mm -hmm. capacity, it, it's felt tight, it's felt overheated at times. Um, there hasn't been a huge, you know, when, when, when you compare historically, there hasn't been a huge amount of M&A. Mm -hmm. um, so you got a whole load of people all competing for the same finite resources of power, land, in some cases emissions. Yeah. Um, so I think volatility is the one is the, is the one word that I would use to to characterize certainly some of the hottest markets. We've seen a few outliers, right? You know, there was the the moratorium that that, that popped up in in, sure. in Amsterdam, which was a, a bit of a peculiarity, and I think has has somewhat blown over. I mean, the the really peculiar thing about that was that um, it was based on on, on, on spatial occupation uh -huh. rather than kind sure. of power uh, consumption. Sure. So I was kind of thinking to myself, well, would, would you not go after the, the logistics sector first? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, much more single story, kind of large span, many sure. more traffic movements. So I thought that was a bit of a, that was a bit of a, a one-off. Like I say, I think it's mostly blown over. Sure. In, in Ireland, there, there, there are, you know, there, there are power constraints, uh, particularly in the greater Dublin area. Um, and Paris, you know, ha, ha, has a few micro phenomena going on there. So, but but I think in the leading markets, volatility is 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 probably the the the, the sum up word for me. And I, and how does that change the future? Yeah. Um, I think for what we're talking to customers more about is how do we insulate you from that volatility? Sure. In yeah. terms of, and and it comes with certain compromises, right? Yeah. So where where previously you were. Again, let's look back even five years ago, maybe, where you, if you said, I'm bringing 20, 30 megawatts online in 
Frankfurt, London, Amsterdam, Paris, Dublin. Hey, you know, that's a lot of supply to bring on today. It's yeah. not a great deal to sure. sniff at. It's crazy, yeah. So we're talking, we're talking to customers more about saying, well, hey, what about if we create a 100 megawatt campus? Mm -hmm. We give you, say, half of it, and we work out some mechanisms that you can grow into it over the medium term mm -hmm. to insulate you from that volatility yeah. so you're not knocking on people's doors and being told that they're stocked out and so on. Yeah. And, 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 you know, really trying to really simulate that value of an option yeah, and 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 bridge the gap between that real difference in uh, in in elasticity and yeah. ela in the elasticity between the supply and demand yeah. side. So that's what 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 we're trying to do, and I think we believe the future is 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 going to be for certainly for these larger players. Um, so that's that 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 that's our broader plan that we that we want to replicate yeah. replicate globally. We are just we just opened our. Um, APAC uh, first office in Singapore, and in Q2 we'll be opening our first office in the Americas, in the Bay Area. Awesome. So it's all go. Um, but I think the, the, like I say, helping our customers solve for their particular problems, sure. rather than just trying to bring what product we think in yeah. our smart ivory tower is great and <laughs> yeah. ram it down their throats yeah. is, is, is what we're thinking about for the medium. Yeah, term. and you know, great approach. It, it's interesting, you, you were talking about almost like the future proofing of helping larger customers with their, with their challenges. It's interesting to see how like smaller customers approach kind of the future proofing concept mm. and then enterprise data center users. And if we think about that from like a power requirement perspective, the like, you know, 500 KW to three to four megawatt range. And yeah. then, you know, when you get into these double digit megawatt requirements, the future proofing looks very different yeah. because it is so much more grander in scale. And you have to think about, to your point, it's not 30 megs, it's 100 megawatts. And it's how do we reserve that power for a specific period of time yeah. if the cu customer has an option or something like that. So it, it's been very fascinating to see uh, the challenges and solutions that companies have put together to try and solve the problems for the larger hyperscale growth. Yeah, well, and I think that's it. It, it requires a different mindset. You know, I mean, we we absolutely acknowledge that we would do a terrible job of trying to manage like 100 customers. <laughs> sure. Like we would be uh, do an awful job yeah. of it. So, you know, we want to, uh, you know, we, we have a small number of customers yeah. at, at scale. But I think the mindset from a design, execution, how you cut a deal, Sure. How you finance it, all these yep. sorts of different things requires a different mindset um, if you're thinking about 100 megawatts as a kind of, you know, homogenous mm -hmm. um, piece of infrastructure that exists rather than because what, what, what I think you can't do is say, hey, I build five meg colos all day. Sure. So I take that mindset and I scale it up 20x and everything's fine. Sure. Doesn't work. Yeah. The economics yeah. don't work. The engineering typically doesn't work. How you operate the thing typically yep. doesn't work. So... Um, I mean, really, whenever we set ourselves the challenge to try and deliver the fastest hyperscale in megawatts, um, to be a bit cheesy, we, we did start with a blank sheet of paper and kind of think, right, of all the projects we've all worked on collectively, yeah. where's all the missed opportunity been? Yeah. Put all, I mean, you know, so when we, we did all that, that's how we got, yeah, you know, that, that's how you bring north of 50 megawatts to market in less than a year sure. in Europe, which yeah. I know in, in the US is a, is a much easier thing to accomplish. Well, um, but you know, it's, it's hard anywhere you go, yeah. you know, maybe it's, you know, easier in the U S just cause it's been maybe done a few more times, just given some of the growth that's taken place over here. That certainly is hitting Europe yeah. today. Um, and I actually want, I want to talk U S versus Europe and get your thoughts on that. Just the differences in a minute. But, um, before we do, you mentioned renewable energy earlier yeah. and just talk about why that's become so important over the last, you know, three to five years and how, you know, if you think about just how the market has really changed to focus on sustainability and you know you obviously spending time on the end user side yeah, yeah. certainly saw that um but but just talk about where the industry is with that and how you've seen that change over time so maybe think thinking about the energy piece overall i mean the the thing that i still think again you know kind of thinking back kind of 10 15 year horizon sure. is the biggest shock that the data center industry has had, to, in, in my opinion, has been how quickly PUE was adopted 
and almost gamified between players mm -hmm. and really sent a shockwave through the industry. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. when's the last tier four facility you ever saw since the sure. concept of PUE yeah. uh, came in, you know? So I think yeah. th think thinking, I, been a while, yeah. for me, thinking about energy in the sector more broadly, yeah. PUE, I mean, that was a massive shock. Mm. Uh, which everyone took very seriously sure. and I think responded to in really quite an, an adult way. And it's mm -hmm. driven, you know, massive design change. Yeah. You know, even line and in, in, interactive UPSs, kind of things like this, which people would have thought you were on drugs if you suggested <laughs> that, you sure. know, in 2006, yeah. something like that. Um, but I think, you know, the renewables piece, well, where does it come from? I mean, I think it would be naive to say it, to, to, to not acknowledge the fact that it is the large end users who are driving a lot of the agenda yeah. from a carbon neutrality perspective. I guess it starts with, well, yes, the best megawatt hours are the ones you never consume. Okay, great. So let's work on the efficiency side. The second part about, I think, a lot of the maturity journeys for these end users as well was a, a, along the offset route. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, pressure from the likes, you know, from, from, within the industry sure. and and also from you know from from commentators particularly sure. with 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 green agendas um demanded that that all the while you're creating more capacity on the demand side that is to say critical megawatts you should be having new additional renewable megawatts to be powering it sure so i think that's the, the those are the macro phenomena i think the the a couple of big things that have that have kind of uh, come along is that you know a lot of I think you you could broadly say that it's mostly wind mm -hmm. and mostly onshore wind mm -hmm. that has been the additional renewables that have been powering new megawatts in the last kind of five to ten years. I think I think I could broadly say that and it would, it would, sure. be, it would be true. There's some solar out there as well. Yeah. There's a few funny things, but I think broadly broadly onshore wind. But I think and certainly in a lot of European markets, and I know in in, in some parts of the US. You can do these merchant without any subsidies. Mm -hmm. um, so you know it's 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 real business. It's it's not greenwashing. It's it, it it makes sense economically. Both sides can be making money on renewables. Yeah. Um. And 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 it doesn't need to be some fabricated kind of greenwashing of our industry. So I think it's. I don't think it's a nice to have. I think it's a must have. Yeah. I do think as an industry we have a responsibility. Um. And even from a, from a consolidation perspective, if we think about, I think one of the we often talk about cloud growth, uh -huh. and we talk about it in this kind of exogenous manner, or 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 in terms of, well, you know, what what is going to be the net growth? Could we, and there's the usual buzzwords that people talk about: five G, IoT, edge, all sorts of unqualified things, which none of us really know what they mean. <laughs> um, but I think the one the one thing that's often overlooked is, well, actually, what is the volume of on-prem today that's going to be migrated? Yeah, uh, because. I mean, I did. I've done a few, a few calculations, most of which are probably more wrong than right. But 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 at the scale you're at, sure. um, kind of thinking, how much of that on-prem enterprise gear today um, is running on um, brown energy? Mm -hmm. So even from before you think about additional growth in the cloud space, if you just think about consolidation, yeah. Um, that's a huge part that that, that, that is going to require a huge volume of renewables to, to power. Yeah. Um, so I kind of think about that even before I think about the the like all I say the that all of the buzzword sure. fueled sure. Uh, all of the charts that go up and to the right. Sure, that's good. Uh, you know, when you think about what you're seeing in Europe today and what we've seen in the U.S. in the last several years, how would you compare the two different markets? Obviously, there's some things that are similar. There's some uh, characteristics that are different, but you know, when you think about just the two different areas, um, you know, maybe even throw in like Asia Pac in there, just as far yeah, as yeah. Uh, these are all areas that you all are interested in and focused on. What do you see as some of the differences? Maybe the first thing is um, the size of the installed base in terms of megawatts, mm. Mm. Uh, both on a you know what. Um, end users have themselves and, yeah. and, and what uh, the third party, uh, you know, colo Co owner operator yeah. provider um, base has. Um, and the reason I think it's worth mentioning that first is because then it's relative because if you then drop in a 30 meg opportunity, yeah. if the installed base is only 200, well, sure. you know what, it's going to send a lot of people panicking and or excited and yeah. or, you know, looking at 
Ferrari brochures and this kind of a thing. So, you know, I think the the the, the relativity relativity of the installed base, I think, is 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 worth mentioning. Yeah. Because because it affects then um, it it affects how the how the market overall responds to yes. inbound um, requests yep. for capacity. Um, I think a couple of other. I'm trying to think about similarities rather than differences, but I think I think it's often a question of timing. So you know, mm-hmm. um, and by timing I mean how often, how far ahead the U.S. is from a trends perspective before it hits uh, Europe, sure. Europe and, and APAC. I mean, I think expectations around delivery time. Uh, you know, for me to say that 12 months is fast in Europe, I know makes people sweat because they think, well, hold on in. Northern Virginia, sure. I can do it in X many months. Yep. Um, so I think uh, the U.S. is definitely leading there uh, as far as a time to market perspective. There, there are some physical constraints, which mean sure. you know, like if you're in the Netherlands, do you know what? You got to put piles in. You can't do <laughs> ground bearing slabs. There are some things that are that are unavoidable. Sure. Um, so I think um, the expect so the timing of the expectation around timing. Yeah. Where that sounds. A bit contrived. I think that's that's one uh, phenomenon, um, and then I think another thing that I think the U.S. is doing a better job of diversity in every sense um, mm. of the workforce in, it, in, in our sector. Um, mm. And I suppose by diversity, I'm I don't mean the kind of just the the male female you know sure. rest of your demographic. Yeah. I mean, uh, for instance, I've come across more nuclear ex submariners uh-huh. in the data center industry in the US sure. than, than anywhere else in the world. So as far as, you know, retraining, reskilling people in, yeah. in relevant other sectors, I think the US is much further ahead and it's something that we should be ashamed of in Europe. You know, there's some people trying to do some good work on it, but um, at the moment, I think it, we're really cannibalizing ourselves as an industry by not bringing enough diverse talent into it. Yeah. Um, and like I say, I think the U.S. Is doing a good job. I think um, Dean and Co. at iMasons are, sure. are directly influencing some yeah. of that, and I know they've got global um, aspirations to do so. Um, but yeah, we're de- we're definitely further behind in in Europe and APAC at, sure. at, at, at challenging that head on. Yeah, the uh, you know it's interesting because you brought up the we've watched this industry uh, change from you know more of a region to region mindset to a global mindset, and so. Part of the advantage of, uh, you know, customers being able to work with providers in different markets is they've got the same people they can work with uh, in a global footprint. And but but your your point is, was a good one about, uh, you know, the fact that, hey, in this market, this is different versus this market over here, because there are market to market, region to region, country to country, continent to continent changes that impact things like timeline and um, you know, different challenges and different advantages. And so it's an interesting, you know, as a user, you kind of have to have that mindset of like, I want global scale, I want global business, but I also need to understand that in these different geographies, there's different challenges and things we have to approach that impact, you know, the end goal, which is getting significant infrastructure to the market. And it's frustrating for everyone, right? (laughs) And I, and I guess maybe one of the most frustrating parts as well is, and maybe picks up a little bit on the on the trend side as well as you know where does the best forecasting come from sure. well it comes from a great trailing data set that you can extrapolate yeah. from sure but you know do we have a long enough time enough period a long enough t- trailing time period sure. uh, you know and a large enough data set to extrapolate from i think you know when we have honest conversations with our customers yeah. they say no sure um so it frustrates everyone exactly when you're saying when you've got yeah. the same notional Elasticity and the economists will hate me for for <laughs> abusing their terminology, but but when you, but, but when you when if you say globally, I've got the same opportunity for elasticity yeah. on the public cloud sales side, yeah. but then globally, the lumpiness and the inelasticity of how yeah. I bring on supply, yeah. I mean, it frustrates the hell out of everyone. Sure, and it's and it's such a young industry, anyway. Um, you know, if you think just like publicly traded. You know, if if digital, I guess 2004 became the first publicly traded REIT. So, you know, we've got 15, 16 years of that type of of history. Uh, but but plus, you look at some of the 
like intense changes that have happened in the last four to five years as far as scale growth is mm. taking place. You know, the data that is there to really truly predict uh, the future in a way that we all would like to is, is hard. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I think what that speaks to, though, is just the dynamics of our business and how much has changed in the last three to five years. I mean, just across the world. This yeah. is just a different different world today than it was then. Well, and you can see it measured, I guess, in a, in a number of different ways. It's certainly some of the press attention, both good and bad, that, sure. that, you know, that, that our sector has, yep. has, has attracted. Um, but also some of the inflows of, 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 of capital that we see. Because, yes. you know, I think we used to talk about that access to capital was a, was a big barrier to entry. Yeah. I think now we're seeing a... A little different feel today. Yeah. Well, I hate to say it, but there's, there's a lot of uneducated money knocking at the door of the sure. sector. And I can, see, I can see why it's occurring, but I think it misses the point that if you look at where a lot of things have gone pop in the past you know, projects at scale or, you know, assets that have become distressed um, is not because of the lack of uh, the lack of capital. Mm -hmm. It's because of failure to execute. Hmm. So I think and, and I think and I think that's that's where the in today's world you say, well, what is what is the big barrier to success or, or, or what differentiates success hmm. from failure? Good. It's the ability to actually execute. Yep. Bring those megawatts up because yes. the stakes are high because when you get it wrong, Oh, it hurts. You get a it lot seriously wrong. Yeah. If you get it wrong, if you get it sure. wrong at one megawatt, it's painful. Yes. If you get it wrong at 100 megawatts, yeah. you're dead. Sure. So um, I think there's a certain naivety in some of that new capital that's coming in. Yeah. And I don't mind me naive in an insulting way. I mean, the misunderstanding that it's the execution risk because this stuff at scale isn't commoditized sure. enough yet. You know, and I don't have all the, all the answers as to how you make it commoditized, yeah. but it, it almost feels like, you know, some of the early days of, of, of renewables where there mm -hmm. was a lot more risk mm -hmm. but it was supported by subsidies right sure we don't have any subsidies there isn't any of that support <laughs> sure. yes we're learning as we go yep. um but i mean i i think as a macro phenomenon it's helpful that there's more capital coming in sure. coming into the market but to underestimate the cost of being wrong yeah i just hope people don't get burned too bad yeah i mean there's a lot of times that i will my my counsel or guidance to people that are looking to place capital in the market is, you know, don't, don't do it. This is not the traditional, you know, uh, office type of requirements. If you're like a traditional, uh, real estate investor, yeah. you know, it, 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 there's different components that make this very different. And so you have to have a long-term mentality. You have to recognize this is a power game. It's not a space game. Uh, you have to recognize energy and the different types of energy is a very important part of how your ability to grow customers into a portfolio now over time. I mean, there's so many other dynamics that are important to digest and really understand before um, taking that step. Because when you take that step in this, in our world, uh, and you get it right, it's great, and you get it wrong, and it's 10 times more awful than getting it wrong in another you know market. Well, particularly if you say you know, a license for service for data center services mm -hmm. versus a lease for a data center asset. Sure. Again, if you breach that SLA at sure. small scale, it's one thing. Sure. If you're doing it at hundred meg, yeah. it's yeah. seriously problematic. Yeah. But but you know what? That's where it gives me a lot of a, a lot of faith um, that our customers have knocked on our door with conversations yeah. that are much more mature and evolved about hey we're not just going to think about it as if it was a massive cola. We're going to think about it differently. Yep. We're going to think about a 15, 20, 30 year mindset, yes. yep. not just this five to seven year type short leases and this highly commoditized, yep. you know, where there is a lot of liquidity. Let, let's approach it from a um, strategic, yeah. um, I believe the word strategy to be grossly overused, <laughs> so I try and use it very I lightly. It. No, but it, but, sense, but yeah. try, trying to take that longer uh, time horizon view, because the, the other thing that we're very bad at as an industry and drawing a parallel maybe with the energy sector, you know, mm. if you look at um, uh, Shell and BP publicizing potential scenarios for free for their entire sector talking yeah. about and you know this is geopolitical, oh, some yeah. it's environmental, and so on. And it's really thinking about long-term planning. 
I think we as an industry are very bad at looking beyond the next deal, beyond sure. the next project, yep. and really trying to scenario plan. You know, we're in the midst, as we talk today, of this coronavirus thing, yep. where it materially is restraining the ability uh, to move people around. Yeah. As we talk today, sure. creation and operation of data center assets requires people. Yep. You know, who had that in their <laughs> sure. scenario plan? Yeah, plan, yeah. And yeah, you probably had it in your business continuity plan. Sure. Something of this of, of this flavor. But I think thinking thinking on the longer term, more in a more diverse kind of a manner about geopolitical, um, macroeconomic environmental yep. is somewhere we should probably be trying to mature to. Sure. I mean, these scenarios are scenarios, right? They're a collection of assumptions. They yep. don't have to be right, but they force you to think strategically and much harder than I think, broadly speaking, as an industry we're doing today. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think our industry is waking up to a number of those things. You know, you mentioned the diversity piece and, and I think there's people in our space that are doing things now uh, proactively looking forward to figuring out, hey, how can we adjust to, uh, you know, make things in our industry better? How can we plan more strategically, um, you know, in efforts to uh, put everyone in a position to handle, you know, future customer growth? I mean, that's the thing is the customer growth, if you're focused on this larger sector, it's, it's, it's so massive that you have to be thinking long-term future and how do we position ourselves to help customers and their needs moving forward? And I also think it's really interesting in our space that companies that f form, as you mentioned, hey, we want to think what are the missed opportunities that we've seen either in our past experience or we, we know that customers are missing today and how can we form a company that meets those needs? It's amazing that you know some of the, some of the first opportunities that come to the doorsteps of companies like yours and others are massive projects. Yeah. I mean, this is not a, and it speaks to the relationships, it speaks to the trust those companies have, um, you know, with the people they're doing business with. But I don't know of an industry where, you know, companies have been around for a few years and are doing, the, the projects that they're doing are as big as they are. I mean, it is, it, it really speaks to a, a unique part of the business that we're in right now. Yeah, and I, and I think that's where execution is king. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, I think it's it's harder in the space, and this might sound a little bit contradictory, but about me talking about this inflow of aspirational capital. Mm -hmm. um, but I would contradict myself there and say, there's probably no harder time to be purely speculative. Oh, sure. That is to kind of be saying, uh, okay, great, I've got some access to capital, I know that. I've got someone who's helping me out who's identified a few sites. I've got some designers over here who've done something where, yeah. you know, I've got all the ingredients loosely lying around, but because the expectations of time to market perspective yeah. um, are so high, it doesn't work to be sure. that pre-pack spec, back yeah. to back anymore. Yeah. The standard ain't, ain't, ain't good enough. I mean, you know, we're on this very aggressive global site selection program at the moment. You know, by, by the end of the year, we're gonna have pretty much a gigawatt's worth of sites in the portfolio, mm. and we want to bring them all to within 12 months of ready for ready for service. Yeah. Um, and you say, well, why 12 months uh, ready for service? Uh, and again, I think that's a mindset thing, because when we talk to customers about, about the scale at which we're really talking about, yeah. I kind of say, well, if it's any sooner than 12 months at the scale we're talking about, can you deploy into it any faster? Mm -hmm. Like if I if I could give it to if I could give you fifty megawatts in six months, are you able to provision enough it? machines to fill it up? Yeah. Like, is it any more useful? And of course, we're gonna globally we're gonna have outliers, as we mentioned. You yep. know, particularly where you gotta build ten stories instead of three, and various other. So you know, but I think the medium we'll be at is probably twelve months away for ready for service, and that's not just a number plucked out plucked out of thin air. That yeah. is through bilateral deep discussions with mm -hmm. customers about well, what is the right number? How speculative we do, do we need to be? Because mm -hmm. again, you know, it makes sense when you're multi-tenant colo to have a shell sitting there, sure. ready to bang some M&E into, yep. and away you go. At 100 megawatts, it doesn't. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. In fact, it's probably bordering on reckless. Yeah. If yeah, you, you don't bet. have a strong enough, you know, signal of demand that yeah. you should be focusing, and and it's probably not from a capital perspective, more from a resource perspective. Mm -hmm. You know. I, I have a finite number of teams yeah. that can be building a finite number of hundreds of megawatts concurrently. Yeah. So if I put them in the wrong place, 
Sure. It's a, it's not totally irreversible, but yeah. it's a pretty expensive a and pretty laborious thing <laughs> to change course to reverse, on. yeah. Um, so that's why we've kind of settled on, on the median point of the portfolio being 12 months away from ready for service yeah. at scale. Feels like the right place to be. Yeah. Well, it sounds like y'all have, you know, an exciting and busy year ahead as it relates to next steps. What gets you most excited about just being in the industry, you know, thinking three, five, ten years from now, um, you know, why are you excited to be in the data center world? I think that we're going to be forced to evolve much more rapidly than we ever had before. Um, um, so I'm, I'm excited for a number of you. I'll maybe just try and pick out three because otherwise we could be here all day. Come on, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the first one is, I think, the level of maturity and not being a commoditized race to the bottom price based discussion yeah. that we're having bilaterally um, as an industry, I think is only a healthy thing. Yep. I think it's going to lead to more sustainable um, portfolios of assets. I think customers are going to be better off in the long term. And I think really trying to get away from that volatility word that we yeah. opened with, I think is going to be good for everyone. Uh, I think mm. you just it's bring good. the temperature down a little yeah. bit on and 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 help us bring new talent in as well as a, yeah. as a consequence so i think that's that that's one the, the maturity of um on both the supply and demand side around deals and, and the opportunity that 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 creates um i think the next thing is the pure excitement of you know being involved with um the growth of cloud yeah. the growth of you know of AI, yeah. and yes, I'm going to mention all the buzzwords that I told you I hated <laughs> earlier on of 5G and self-driving cars, and you can't, you, it can't be this year without saying convergence and all these there sorts of things, which are yeah. phenomena that no one really understands. Sure. But it feels great to be, you know, at least a contributor to being yeah. on the on, yeah. on 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 the on the cutting edge there. Um, and thirdly, I think the the ability to create opportunity for deep engineering talent yeah. um, across the board. Um, I feel like, and this is partly partly me being a recovering engineer, um, but also I feel like on the operation side and maybe on, on, on the kind of design side as well, engineering has become a, maybe a little bit devalued or, or, or undervalued. And so, you know, the more opportunity that we can create and the more yeah. sophisticated that opportunity is, um, it feels good to be to be having a broader, more diverse ecosystem of of engineering talent, you know, that, that we are helping to to, to create. So yeah, that was the top three I could think. I of. love it. That's awesome, man. Okay, so Pete, Chief Development Officer with Yonder, uh, it's yondergroup.com. Yeah, it's your website. So if people are watching, you're interested in learning more about it, you can jump on their site. Um, and learn more. And I just want to thank you for being here and your thoughts on the industry. Like I said, this is one of my favorite things I get to do. And, you know, you just your time in the space, recovering engineering background uh, and just where you are today. It's really always interesting to sit down with industry leaders and talk about the market. So thanks for spending time here and look forward to watching you guys grow in the future. Thank you. No, it's been great. And yeah, next time, hopefully we'll organize some better weather. You bet. <laughs> Tornado last time I was here. Pissing rain this time. You bet. <laughs> Brought me Irish weather. <laughs> I like, know. Come on. Dallas. So anyway. Next time we'll uh, sort that out. You bet. Thanks for being here. Super. Thanks, David.